financial markets in turmoil. What are the root causes of the financial crisis? The dollar losing value. Heading for its biggest loss in nearly three decades. Will Social Security even be there? I don't know. Buy or rent? That's a very good question. Interest rates? I'm not so sure. Where do you put your money? I don't know. Welcome to the show that answers your questions. This is Follow the Money Weekly with your host, economist, and best selling author. Here's Jerry Robinson. Ah, friends, welcome to you all around the world. Welcome to Follow the Money Radio. So grateful to have you here along for the ride. Well, friends, it's that time of year again. Time to raise America's debt ceiling. Now that Washington has passed trillions of dollars of new spending bills over the last several years, it's time to decide whether to pay for those items. You know, the debt ceiling, which is really a misunderstood and underestimated term that holds immense significance for the economic stability of the United States, really serves as a critical control mechanism. It really determines how much the government can borrow to finance its operations. So what happens when the debt ceiling becomes a political battleground? That's exactly what we see playing out before our eyes right now here in 2023. And we find ourselves witnessing this high stakes game of brinksmanship you know, this political brinksmanship between U.S. lawmakers, and we're seeing recklessness, we're seeing a lot of uncertainty around the debt ceiling. Will it be raised? Will Washington keep borrowing to pay its bills, or will it suddenly, you know, uh, stop borrowing? Of course, this is kind of an absurd question, but as the deadline is approaching and tensions are rising and concerns are intensifying, We can really bring some clarity to this by demystifying the concept of the debt ceiling itself. So what exactly is the debt ceiling and why is it so important uh, to the media, to the economy, to Wall Street and to politicians? Well, put simply, the debt ceiling is a statutory limit that is set by Congress itself for the amount of debt that the U.S. government can take on to finance its operations and meet its obligations. So it's a it's an actual statutory limit that is set by the Congress itself and it imposes basically a limitation upon the government's capacity to borrow. Now, if you look back historically, you know, you'll see that oftentimes this hasn't been as big of a deal uh, as it has become in our very politically divisive environment that we find ourselves today. Politics has always been divisive and there's always been arguments, but we've really seen the intensification of this in over the last, you know, probably two or three decades, probably since, uh, you know, since the 1980s or so, we've really seen an increase, an increasing amount of intensity over political arguments. But typically it's just a routine legislative process. And one thing that's very important for you to understand. And this kind of gets lost in the mix whenever you're listening to, you know, the right-wing media or the left-wing media. Often they don't bring up some of the basic facts. But what's important to understand is that the debt ceiling here in the United States that the Congress uh, is authorized to raise does not authorize new spending. What you're doing is is you're actually raising the debt ceiling by what that means is you are raising Uh, you're authorizing the government to pay for expenses that Congress has already approved. So it's kind of a backward system where Congress will approve all of these bills, but then occasionally they have to go over and raise the debt ceiling so that they can actually pay those bills. Okay, so that's the way that it works. Now, over the years, as the country's economy and obligations have gotten bigger, Congress has had to repeatedly raise the debt ceiling to accommodate all of the rising amounts of debt. Right. And as I mentioned, this process has been pretty routine, kind of a formality uh, in Washington. But now the debt ceiling has become such a point of contention, largely because the debt has become so big and it's so easy to point at and say, we've got to do something about this. Well, we all agree that something should be done about the debt in 
uh, that Washington is incurring because Washington's debt is rot- not really Washington's debt. It's your debt, right? You're the taxpayer. You're the one who has to pay the debt. So it is an important topic. It is something that we need to address. It is something that we need to do. We do need to see Washington spend less money. I wrote a book called Bankruptcy of Our Nation that really explaining that this is a very important thing that we must do. We must deal with our out-of-control spending at the federal and even in the state level, okay? But you're not going to solve that by choosing not to pay your bills every time the debt ceiling debate comes up. It shows you how distracted the politicians are. They don't even think about the debt until the debt ceiling comes around. And then they try to make that their big wedge issue as if by ending that, that's going to somehow solve our problems, okay? That's not going to solve our problems. It's just going to lead us into default. So that's not how you solve the situation. What we need is financial sanity in Washington. We need lawmakers to commit to fiscal responsibility, right? But that's just that just doesn't seem like it's going to happen. And so the, the debt ceiling then becomes kind of a useful tool for creating this conversation, although it's a terrible way to bring up the conversation. There, the conversation should happen one of the other uh, days of the year instead of trying to constantly make the debt ceiling the uh, debate uh, for our out-of-control spending. So it's nice to point you know, the debt ceiling and say, well, we shouldn't do that. Well, you know, that's true. We shouldn't be spending all of this money, but we already did. Right. So we have to raise the debt ceiling to pay for what otherwise we default on what we've promised. We default on our obligations. Right. And so it's important that you as a listener understand that raising the debt ceiling doesn't give the government a blank check to spend uh, new, uh, for, you know, for new obligations. It fulfills existing financial obligations and maintains the country's solvency. Right. Uh, but again, the debt ceiling has been used for politicians, by politicians, uh, as leverage. It's used to advance their agendas. It's used to score political points. It's used to, uh, you know, just to create all kinds of uh, tug of tug of war between the two sides uh, to extract concessions uh, in order to, uh, you know, to further their political agendas. Right now, there's a very simple flow chart that we've created. Uh, here internally at Follow the Money. We did it a long time ago. I think I even mentioned it in the book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation. Very simple flow chart on how the political debate over the de- debt ceiling in Washington works. It's very, very simple. It, here's, here, here's how the flow chart works. You first ask yourself, who is the president? Okay, Who's the president? Now, if the president is a Democrat, then Democrats in the Senate and in the House are going to do what? They're going to want what? They're going to want to increase the debt ceiling. Okay. Now, what if, however, a Democrat is not president? What if it's a Republican that's president? What do you think? What, what, what happens there? Well, it turns out that if you have a Republican who is president, then Republicans are going to want to what? Raise the debt ceiling. Okay. So to simplify this, just remember that if you're a Republican, the only time that you are for raising the debt ceiling is when a Republican majority is running Washington and a Republican is in the White House. Inversely, if you're a Democrat, the only time that you're for raising the debt ceiling is when a Democrat is president, right? So that makes it very, very simple. And you say, well, that's just too simple. That, that certainly can't be the way that it actually works. Oh, my dear friend, it's exactly how it works. So if you're a Republican, then when Democrats are running Washington, debt ceiling increases are bad, right? But when Republicans are running Washington, debt ceiling increases are what? If you're a Republican, good. All right, so you've got it. So here we are. We're moving right along, understanding the simple flow chart. So let's go back in time. For example, from 2000 to 2006, when Republicans were running the White House, the Senate, and the, and the House of Representatives, this would have been a perfect time for Republicans to be for increasing the debt ceiling. And during this time, the Republicans raised the debt ceiling no less than four times. Okay, so in June of 2002, uh, Republicans raised the debt ceiling to 6.4 trillion. Okay, in May of 2003, Republicans raised the debt ceiling to 7.3 trillion. Okay, and then in November of 2004, Republicans raised the debt ceiling to 8.2 trillion. In March of 2006, Republicans raised the debt ceiling to 9 trillion. In fact, 
I have an audio clip here for you from that time that shows a slew, uh, and actually you'll hear it because this is on this podcast, but you'll hear a slew of Republicans uh, from both the Senate and the House talking about the immediate urgency to raise the debt ceiling underneath President George W. Bush. Roll the tape. I spoke to an elderly woman on a radio program in Richmond, Indiana today. And Mr. Speaker, she said with fear in her voice that she was worried that a conservative like me would not support raising the debt ceiling and would put at risk her Social Security check. Well, I assured her then, and I rise today to assure all those that are listening, Mr. Speaker, that I will not do that. I truly believe if you owe debts, pay debts. It is uh, occasionally something that has to be done in order to continue to keep the Social Security checks going and to keep uh, people's benefits going. If the Treasury cannot issue new debt, the government may be unable to meet many of its obligations. Among other things from time to time, I found myself among those who voted for raising the debt limit when the other side got us in a position of having to push it or close down the government. I voted from time to time for a debt limit raising. I didn't like doing that, but sometimes you've got to govern around here. We've got to raise the debt. Uh, that's uh, to prevent default. And, and so that's a chance for demagoguery. It's not really a, 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 a real issue. Over the last uh, several weeks, we've had uh, many of my friends on the other side of the aisle join with us in saying that it's very important for us to, as quickly as possible, take action to increase the debt ceiling. The issue before us is really America's responsibility to pay its bills, to meet obligations that America and Congress, as our members, has already incurred. And yep. as the distinguished gentleman knows, we've got to address the debt issue, the debt ceiling issue. We will have to raise the debt ceiling. That's an important function that's been done before, and we'll, we'll do it again. If you owe debts, pay debts. All right. So whenever a Republican is president, say like George W. Bush back in 2000 through 2008, then what we have, of course, is uh, Republicans busy pumping the debt ceiling levels ever higher. Uh, and of course, many Democrats were voting against those evil debt ceiling increases, how they're going to bankrupt the country. And in fact, we have some audio of that. Let's go back in time to that time in March of 2006, whenever the Democrats were pretty outraged that the Republicans just kept raising the debt ceiling over and over and over. And here is then Senator Majority Leader Harry Reid, who was voting against the Republican-led debt ceiling increase back in March of 2006. Roll the tape. Maybe they can convince the public they're right. I doubt it. Because most Americans know that increasing debt is the last thing we should be doing. After all, I repeat, the baby boomers are about to retire. Under the circumstances, any credible economist would tell you we should be reducing debt, not increasing it. Again, on debt, Thomas Jefferson. These are his words. And to preserve our independence, we must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. We must make our election between economy and liberty, or perfusion and servitude. President Thomas Jefferson. So the Democrats not too crazy there about the debt ceiling increases underneath the Republican president. And then, of course, there's then Senator Barack Obama, who was a presidential candidate at the time, and he was railing against the Bush administration's constant debt ceiling limit increases. Roll the tape. The problem is, is that the way Bush has done it over the last eight years is to take out a credit card from the Bank of China in the name of our children, driving up our national debt from $5 trillion for the first 42 presidents. Number 43 added $4 trillion by his lonesome so that we now have over $9 trillion of debt that, that we are going to have to pay back. $30,000 for every man, woman, and child. That's irresponsible. It's unpatriotic. So despite 
their very best efforts, the Democrats and their calls for fiscal responsibility were completely ignored by the spendthrift Republicans underneath George W. Bush. Later in September of 2007, the debt ceiling was raised to $9.8 trillion. Then again, in July of 2008, the debt ceiling increased to $10.6 trillion. And then finally, the final debt ceiling increase underneath President George W. Bush was signed off in October of 2008. This time it was raised to $11.3 trillion. So what you notice here is a dynamic. You have a Republican president who needs debt ceiling increases raised. I mean, somebody's got to govern, right? And so therefore, the other side, the Democrats, are howling at the moon about how this is not a good idea. We shouldn't be digging ourselves in debt, our poor grandchildren. How are we going to afford all of this? Now, these were great times for Democrats to be against debt ceiling increases and for Republicans to be for them. But things suddenly changed for Republicans in 2009. Whenever Bush Jr. was out of the White House and then a democratically controlled White House, Senate, and House of Representatives came into power, it was time for a shift in the Republican attitude towards the whole debt ceiling issue, you see. Again, remember how the flow chart works. Is a Republican in the White House? Republicans should be for debt ceiling increases in this case. Is a Democrat in the White House? Well, Republicans should be against that uh, uh, debt ceiling, and the Democrats should be for uh, the debt ceiling increases, okay? So let's just move right into the Obama presidency. In February of 2009, just one month after he was sworn into office, President Obama signed off on an increase in the debt ceiling to two, uh, to $12.1 trillion, right? Uh, later that same year, in December, Obama and company wasted no time approving yet another increase in the debt ceiling, and it was the Democrats calling for a new debt ceiling level of $12.4 trillion. And then again in February of 2010, Mr. Obama and the Congress approved a hike in the debt ceiling up to $14.3 trillion. And of course, this was all unacceptable to the, uh, the Republicans at the time. In fact, you may recall during that time that there was a lot of howling at the moon by Republicans saying how and beating their chest, how can we afford to raise the debt ceiling, uh, you know, by another trillion dollars, a, even though they had been up until this point underneath President Bush, not a win, not even wincing, you know, at raising the debt ceiling. But when a Democrat got into office, it all changes. It all changes. Right. So after Obama, and we could go and dig into that deeply and see all, there was all kinds of stuff there, but for the sake of time, we're going to keep moving because we have to remember that Obama uh, served two terms and then a Republican was elected as president. So what do you think happened? What do you think happened? Well, in 2017, President uh, Donald Trump entered the White House and in 2017, the debt limit was reset at uh, 20 and a half trillion, by the way, 20.5 trillion. And then in 2018, the Republicans voted again to raise the debt ceiling to 22 trillion. And then in 2019, they raised it to 28.4 trillion. None of these increases to the debt ceiling, by the way, when they were signed into law, contained a precondition to cut spending. So there were no spending cuts required on the part of the GOP in order to raise the debt ceiling from 20 trillion in 2017 all the way up to 28 trillion by 2019. Now you say, why? Why would the Republicans be so f uh, for the debt ceiling increases? You've forgotten our flow chart, uh, dear listener. Remember, if the Republican is in the White House, the Republicans vote for the debt ceiling increase. If a Democrat is in the White House, the Democrats vote for a debt ceiling increase. In fact, here is President Trump talking about the sanctity and the sacred nature of the debt ceiling and how no one in their right mind would ever use the debt ceiling as a political tool or a political weapon. This is, by the way, during President Trump's presidency, speaking from the Oval Office. Roll the tape. I can't imagine anybody ever even thinking of using the debt ceiling as a negotiating wedge. Uh, when I first came into office, I asked about the debt ceiling, and I understand debt ceilings, and I certainly understand a, uh, the, the highest rated credit ever in history and a debt ceiling. And I said, I remember to Senator Schumer and to Nancy Pelosi, 
Would anybody ever use that to negotiate with? They said, absolutely not. That's a sacred element of our country. They can't use the debt ceiling to negotiate. Right. So underneath the president, who is Republican, the Republicans are signing off on debt ceiling increases just right and left every time one is raised. Now, let's fast forward the tape now. This was just two months ago, and this is President Trump, who is no longer president, but he does have a comment on the debt ceiling. He's very concerned that the Republicans are not using the debt ceiling as that political bargaining chip that he once said should never be done. Here's President Trump speaking from Mar-a-Lago just two months ago about the GOP's need to use the debt ceiling to get what they want politically. Roll the tape. McConnell is either the worst negotiator in the history of politics or he's a stone-cold crook. There can be no other explanation as to why he has become such a rubber stamp for the Democrats. Republicans use debt ceiling to get it all back. You'll get every ounce of it back. Use debt ceiling. Take it back. So use the debt ceiling, in in other words, in order to get what you want. And so now, of course, President Biden is in office and the debt ceiling must not be raised. Now, hopefully what this this segment has done is it helps has really clarified and provided a flow chart perhaps for you so you understand how the whole thing works. It's really quite absurd, quite frankly, when you think about it, how the debt ceiling is raised nonstop whenever a uh, Republican is in office by the Republicans and how the debt ceiling is raised nonstop by Democrats when a Democrat is in office. It shows you the, the absurdity of the system in which we live. Now, let's just take a step back for a minute and assess the potential impact of a U.S. default. So let's say that as of the recording, by the way, of this podcast, neither uh, President Biden nor House Speaker McCarthy have come to a resolution on the debt ceiling. Now, I expect they will very soon. And in fact, by the time this podcast comes out and it fu- you know, fully gets out there, we could already have a debt ceiling increase. Uh, we could already have a vote or a plan or some sort of provision that allows the debt ceiling to be increased. But as of this recording, we still don't have that. So let's just take a step back, as I mentioned it. And let's, let's talk about what the impact of a default would be. So domestically speaking, it would certainly undermine the country's financial stability. Uh, it would potentially lead to a downgrade of the nation's credit rating, which would be very devastating. That would lead to increased borrowing costs, not only for the government, but it would spread across the, the uh, economy. It would make it more expensive for the government to fund programs and services that it is obligated to provide. You'd also have uh, a disruption in the flow of payments by the government to employees, to contractors, to social security beneficiaries, to veterans, and you know many others. So obviously, if the United States were to default and say, we are not going to pay the tab that we have already you know racked up, then you would definitely see that affect the government, interest rates, it would affect consumer spending, it would affect business confidence, it would affect economic growth. And not just here in the United States, it would have profound global implications. The U.S. dollar, which is the global reserve currency today, could certainly be hit by this. The dollar stability, you would have a loss of faith in Washington's ability to get things done and to actually pay for their own bills. Uh, And then, of course, we have this globalized economy. And so a U.S. default would trigger what we would consider to be a chain reaction. So you would have lots of volatility in the markets. Investors would be seeking out safe havens. Uh, Trade flows could be interrupted. Uh, You know, it would just be a bad, bad deal, right? And you can look back at nations that have done this, who have said, we're not going to pay our debts, or we're not going to pay the tab that we've already run up. You can look at countries like Argentina. That didn't go very well. Greece, right? That didn't go very well. Uh, The United States even defaulted back in the 18th century or 19th century. We can look back at some of those cases. Those weren't good uh, times. But here's the real thing that you listening need to understand about all of this is that China is waiting in the wings and watching this. But what is China trying to do right now? It's trying to boost its currency around the world, the yuan, Argentina, Uh, we just mentioned, has been adopting the yuan. Brazil has been adopting the yuan. Russia has been adopting the yuan. 
uh, Iran, and many other countries have been uh, gravitating towards China. And China is using this, leveraging it against the United States because China is on, it has a lot of uh, economic and political clout and it's growing uh, every year. Okay, so China benefits directly from a perceived act of instability here in the United States, uh, economic instability. So if the United States were to default on its debt to make a political point, this would actually be devastating for the United States, but it would be very positive for China and Russia, quite frankly. Uh, so China and Russia would greatly benefit if the United States were to default upon its debt. China would be the primary beneficiary as people began to realize the United States is not so solvent and the United States can't be trusted. Therefore, China suddenly becomes a bit more appealing in the eyes of other economic actors around the world. Now, all that being said, and China, you know, we can't stress that enough, that China is watching this very closely. The stooginess of our politicians plays right into the hands of China. They want to display, they want to uh, show the United States as being inept. This plays right into their hands. Um, and so China really wants the United States to default. This would be great for their economy. This would be not near term, of course, but it would be great longer term. If they're playing the long term game, which they are, they would love to see the United States shoot itself in the foot by defaulting on its debt that it's promised to pay. This would really, really set them ahead 10, 20 years in the process of what they're doing as their economy is growing and becoming more you know, widespread and influential. Now, all that being said, we have to say that we do not expect that the United States is going to not pay its bills. The reason why we don't expect that Washington is not going to pay its bills is A, because they know that it would be political suicide. Uh, but B, they also, that would require Washington to come up with another plan besides kicking the can down the road, right? And, and Washington's not so great at that. You know, Washington uh, understands that uh, borrowing money is the safest way to finance the government. If they raise taxes, the people don't want taxes raised. And so they're going to fight against that. If you want to raise taxes upon the rich, the rich are going to, you know, have an incredible amount of uh, money spent to stop those taxes from being raised. If you raise them on the poor, well, then you're also going to have a backlash from poor voters. And of course, if you try to cut spending, well, nobody agrees on where you should cut spending. You know, nobody really has a plan. We've talked before that one of the best places to cut spending would be the $858 billion uh, Pentagon budget, which has no accountability. That'd be a great place to start. But, uh, you know, they're not going to do that. So, so, you know, so what are you going to cut? I am a staunch Republican, and I think the government needs to make cuts. There's got to be cuts in Washington where it's not going to hurt us. Okay, let's go over the list of what we should cut. Should we cut veterans benefits? No. Social Security? No. Education? No. Sandy Relief? No. Medicare? No. Health care? Absolutely not. Military? No way. Unemployment benefits? No. Should we cut veterans benefits? Not at all. Social Security? No. Education? Nope. Medicare? No. How about the military? Not at all. How about unemployment? Nope. How about the Sandy Fund? Not at all. I mean, everybody says we have to cut the government, but nobody wants to give anything up that they're actually getting from the government. Uh, the federal government should cut their spending. I think they have a big spending problem on, on stupid stuff that we don't need. Should we cut the military? Definitely not. I'm totally for budget cuts. What should we cut? I don't know. How about education? No. How about the hurricane relief fund? No. How about unemployment checks? No. How about the military? No. How about food inspectors? No. How about veterans benefits? No. So what should we cut? I don't know. And we've talked about this before, that nobody wants to cut anything, right? They don't. They want their taxes low. They want gas prices low. They want inflation low. And they want, they want to be number one. And they want their spending to keep going up. They don't want to cut spending on anything, right? So it's just all absurd. So Washington has no other solution but to keep borrowing money. So when somebody says, well, is, is the U.S. going to default upon its debt? Well, that's the same thing as saying, is Washington going to stop borrowing money to pay its bills, 
right? Well, no, of course not. I mean, you're going to have to force Washington to stop borrowing money to pay its bills. Uh, It's not going to stop itself. It's not going to force itself to stop borrowing money to pay bills. It's going to continue to borrow money to pay bills. So it's just going to kick the can down the road. So the point is, is that we do not expect Washington to default upon the debt. We do not expect that that's going to happen. Instead, we expect there to be a last minute compromise as usual and the political theater you know will continue until that happens and then of course once we finish that once we actually get a debt ceiling increase then we're going to move on and lurch to the next crisis right so it's constantly a crisis uh, so once the debt ceiling increase is there then there'll be a whole nother concern people will be worried about that's just how it works now when we look at the current debt ceiling drama, maybe in conclusion here, I want to say this because we've talked about this topic now for about 30 minutes and I want to bring this to a close. But you know, when we think about the current debt ceiling drama, it really should serve as a stark reminder for the need for Washington to develop long-term solutions that go beyond these temporary extensions, these last-minute deals, uh, we need a reevaluation of the entire system, right? We need to find alternatives that can ensure financial stability without risking the destruction of the nation's economy and the people's economic well-being. You know, so what do we need from lawmakers? We need long-term fi- uh, fiscal planning, right? Just like everybody else has to do that, you have to take care of your finances. You've got to keep you know, you've got to keep paying your bills. You've got to, you know, take care of your family. Well, Washington, you know, has to do the same thing. They have to plan. They've got to plan for the future, right? And other countries are better at this than the United States. The United States may have, a, you know, the biggest revenues, but they don't handle those revenues well. They, they bring in all this money, and then they end up kicking the can down the road on everything, and they don't have a good long-term fiscal plan. In fact, every time you look out uh, at America's economy out, say, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, you know, you're seeing negative things. I mean, technology and, you know, all of these different industries, they may be, you know, poised to do well, but Washington and its fiscal plan, it's a wreck, right? It's a total wreck and it gets worse by the year. So we need spending reforms, right? We need to actually uh, cut spending on things that we simply don't need. And I'm not talking about cutting spending on, you know, uh, children or you know poor people, vulnerable people. No, absolutely, positively not. There is so much that can be cut. Just say from the Pentagon budget itself, there are so many other places that you can cut, but they don't want to touch it because everybody has a lobbying group and everybody has uh, their hand in the in the pot, and so nobody wants to take a cut. Nobody's going to willingly give it up. And then uh, we need responsible budgeting, just like, you know, you have to budget at home to pay your bills and to be a wise steward of your finances. Washington needs to do the same thing, right? And in the end, fiscal responsibility uh, is the key. Uh, We need fiscal responsibility from Washington. Uh, It's unlikely that we're going to see it anytime soon. It's unlikely that we're going to see people actually take this seriously in Washington. But this is exactly what we need. We need sanity in America's fiscal situation. So these high stakes games of fiscal chicken are not solving the problem, right? We need real solutions, not theatrics designed to promote a political agenda. All right, friends, welcome back to the broadcast. We are in our final moments here of today's episode, and I sure hope you enjoyed uh, today's episode on the debt ceiling debate, the debt ceiling drama. It's kind of tough to enjoy a topic like this, isn't it? How uh, I want to make you pull your hair out when you think about the insanity of it all. But, uh, you know, it's just how it is here living in the land of the free and the home of the brave. We are fully in debt up to our eyeballs. And not passing the debt ceiling and not increasing it is not the best way forward. The best way forward is for Washington to get its ducks in a row and actually implement financial responsibility. It's sad 
that the debt ceiling itself has to be the only time that our leaders will even talk about this very important topic. So in conclusion, I always like to leave you with a final word, this time taken from the book of Proverbs, chapter 22, verse 7, where it reads, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is a slave to the lender. You know, throughout history, nations and individuals alike have grappled with the consequences of indebtedness. And the U.S. debt ceiling debate serves as a powerful reminder of the delicate balance between fiscal responsibility and the potential risks of borrowing beyond our means. That's just something to think about. Remember, friends, when you want the truth about the global economy, just follow the money. Have a safe and prosperous week, and we'll see you right back here next time. Until then, God bless. contained on the follow the money podcast is strictly for informational and educational purposes it should not be construed as specific investment advice the views and opinions of our guests and sponsors including tom cloud are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of ftmdaily.com or robinson media group llc jerry robinson does hold an insurance license and at times may offer consulting on life insurance and fixed retirement income products follow-up individualized responses to email or phone requests that involve the rendering of personalized investment advice for compensation will not be made absent compliance with state investment advisor registration requirements or an applicable exemption or exclusion and applicable insurance regulations past performance is not indicative of future results you should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment decision discussed on the podcast. Remember, never do your financial planning through podcast or radio. It's your money. Be wise. Do your due diligence and always consult a trusted financial